Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is communicating with different um, types of, of coworkers. So we're going to start with communicating with peers. Communicating with peers is horizontal flow of information. Trust and respect allows for cooperation and co cohesiveness. So we want to communicate with peers with respect. We're treating them as if they um, know they may not know the same things that we do, but as if they are at the same level because they are. Too often in a peer-to-peer -peer situation, one person is communicating down, um, which tends to block communication and cause conflict. Um, we want to make sure that we're using that we're communicating accurately. Um, SBAR is a technique for uh, giving report, but it can also be used. Um, in some other situations <clears throat> in which we need to communicate. You want to communicate assertively. And one of the things that you should learn now is about communication types. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about communication types. Passive communication, assertive communication, aggressive communication, and passive aggressive communication. <clears throat> so passive is just allowing the other person to run over your boundaries. So you and another nurse want to use the same computer, passive um, would be not even addressing it, okay? Um, let's make it a little bit more because computers could be first come, first serve. Uh, maybe um, you have been assigned to um, a really difficult um, patient several days in a row and you need a break. So you come in for work and you're assigned to that patient again. Passive communication would be not communicating that, uh, not letting the charge nurse know that you need a break. Or maybe saying so just really like, well, you know, if it's okay, um, maybe someone else could take care of that patient today. Okay, that's passive communication. The body language is passive. The voice is passive. Um, and it allows others to invade your boundaries. Aggressive would be demanding to be placed on another assignment. I won't do it. I refuse to take care of that patient again. Okay, that's aggressive. Assertive communication states your needs without demanding. Assertive communication would be, I really, really need um, a break. I've had this patient for three days in a row. Um, he punched me twice yesterday. I really need a break. Uh, would it be possible for someone else to care for that patient? And here's why assertive communication is more respectful. It states your needs, but it also leaves space for the needs of others. Okay. So, it, the, the thing that's scary about assertive communication is that it leaves room for other people to say no. It leaves room for the boundaries of others. So the charge nurse can consider that request and can make a decision that they still really, really need you to care for that patient today and may offer to provide some other supports. Um, the one I mentioned, but I did not give an example, was passive aggressive. Passive aggressive is when um, someone usually has um, has a belief system, uh, whether they're aware of it, that they need to always be nice. Um, and they, they don't know how to assertively communicate their needs. And so instead of saying, I need a break, the passive aggressive communication might be, well, of course I've got that patient again. Or I would think that someone else could do this for once, but maybe not. Um, passive aggressive tends to be very martyr like and um, it's kind of that those little veiled jabs that they can claim oh I was just being nice I was just saying something so you want to work for assertive communication when you're communicating it doesn't matter who you're communicating with but if you're communicating with someone at the same level in the organization the information flow is horizontal. You want to respect their boundaries. You want them to respect your boundaries and you want to use assertive communication. Um, what happens if someone is bullying? 
how do you address that? If they're bullying you, how do you address it? If they're bullying someone else, how do you address it? And again, you can use assertive communication. I saw an amazing example of this on Twitter. Um, a novice nurse was um, uh, scheduled to work in an ER with a new crew and the charge nurse was polite and respectful to everyone else, but was just rude to the new nurse, very uh, dismissive. And um, the new nurse said, I respect you and your position. I don't do hazing. So I need you to speak to me respectfully. If I'm doing something wrong, I need you to let me know. And that's a very assertive way to handle it. Um, that respects the charge nurse's boundaries, but it also respected his own boundaries. And that's a really important place to get to. A lot of us in our culture are not used to communicating that way. Um, and in particular, a lot of women have kind of been trained not to communicate that way. We've often been trained to hint at things and hope that people get it because if we outright say what we want, we're being too forward or too aggressive, okay? So that's something you need to work on is develop that boundary and learn assertive communication. State what you want or what you need, but leave room for the other person to say no. Um, communicating with subordinates. What if you're in a position of supervising or delegating to someone? How do you communicate with them? First of all, you need to be honest. Actually, first of all, you need to respect them. Even if they are below you on the chain of command, in a facility, they are still a person um, with a knowledge base worthy of respect, okay? They still are worthy of respect. So you want to work to develop trust, and you want uh, to be honest in order to do that. You can use informal communication to get to know staff members as people, but if you're not really, um, you're not really sincere about wanting to know them as people, uh, people can perceive that. So don't fake it, really be concerned, really care about the people who work for you and what their lives are like. Um, recognize positives, always recognize when your staff do something correctly. When your staff do something right, recognize it. Um, be aware of signals. When you call an employee to the office, um, you may be just calling them to the office to give them a, hand them a paycheck or give them um, an ID tag that came in the mail. But when you when you get called to the office as an employee, you always have that moment of, oh, what have I done wrong? So be aware of the signals that you're sending. <clears throat> Develop some kind of mechanism for informal feedback from your staff. You want your staff to feel comfortable letting you know about issues that they have. So be open to that. Develop some mechanism that they can give you that feedback. Pay attention to that feedback. And that doesn't mean you have to do everything that the staff suggests uh, because all of it may not be in your power and all of it may not work. But at, look at those, look at that feedback. And if there are good suggestions, implement them and give credit. Give credit to the people that came up with the idea. Um, communicating, now we're gonna do one more and then uh, actually a couple more sections and then we're gonna switch to upper level management. So <clears throat> communicating with physicians and other providers. Notice I didn't put this with communicating with superiors or uh, with subordinates or with peers. Um, healthcare providers and physicians are a separate entity and we work with them. Okay, nursing is a separate profession. We work with providers. We're not necessarily support, subordinate to providers. We are in the position frequently of following their orders for patient care, and but we but nursing also has its own set of um, knowledge, its own knowledge base that physicians really don't necessarily know. So the communication with physicians can be really different. Um, different. It's kind of a challenging place. There are some barriers to nurse physician communication. One of them is a difference in communication styles. Nurses tend to tell a story, describe what happened. Physicians tend to be action oriented. What, why are you calling me? What do you want me to do? So when you're going to call a provider, get your stuff together. 
have all your information together. That's what SBAR is really handy for. Who is this patient? What do they need to know about this patient in order to answer your question? What is your assessment of the situation? What is your question? Okay, you're either asking for a recommendation or you're recommending an order. So look at communicating more clearly and specifically. Sometimes there's not a lot of structure or policies um, to support communication between nurse and physician. So that can lead to people communicating however, um, however they prefer. That can actually lead to some legal areas because there are providers that will want you to text some information over non-secure lines and that can be really um, legally risky. There are sometimes differences of opinion about what should be communicated. And I'm on med Twitter and nurse Twitter, which is really interesting because I'm seeing, I see both sides a lot of times on Twitter. There are providers complaining about being called for elevated blood pressures that they're not, that's not necessary to treat. What they may not understand is that there are protocols. We have to call no matter what. We have to call if it says to call because if something happens and we did not make that phone call, if it says contact provider for systolic BP greater than 160, if I don't call the provider, then I'm at fault. Okay? I'm negligent. So sometimes the policies need to be um, need to establish, need to be kind of hashed out between the disciplines to figure out what should be communicated and how. Um, I have known providers that um, who did not want critical labs called until 7 a.m. They wanted critical, they didn't want to be woken up for labs. So there's a disagreement. A nurse gets a critical um, INR. Do you wait from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. to call a critical INR? What if your patient falls at 645 and hits their head? Um, so there's a disagreement or difference of opinion about what should be communicated and when and how. Um, there are frequent interruptions and disruptions to that communication. You're trying to call the provider. They're in a patient room. They call you back. You're down the hall. Um, so there are frequent interruptions and disruptions. Um, and sometimes there's just there's some difficulty with the frequency with which communication occurs. So I worked on a very busy unit with three um, academic practices at one time. And they we had, I believe it was a 30 bed unit and we might turn over 15 or 20 of those beds every day. So lots and lots of potential for phone calls. Each practice or each, um, each practice had about four levels. You could start with the PA and then the PA, you would go to the junior resident and then you would go to the senior resident. You might even go to the fellow before you went to the attending. So we, there were so many opportunities to communicate with providers. So we actually developed a system for that because residents were getting paid page 55 times a day for things like discharge planning or um, a Tylenol, um, things that could possibly wait a bit. So we developed a system and in that system, the charge nurse kept a list of all the things that we needed to ask each specific practice or set of residents. And unless we had an urgent need, uh, we would just wait until they rounded because they did round several times a day. So when they come around on rounds, we give them the list, they deal with the list. If we had an urgent need arise for that particular practice, um, then we would go ahead and call and deal with the urgent need. And then we could ask, do you have time for a list right now? So that respected nursing time. We weren't spending 16 hours a day in a 12 hour shift trying to get hold of providers, but it also respected the resident's time who were not answering the phone you know, 600 times a day while they were trying to do rounds and surgeries and clinic and all of the things. So sometimes there are systemic problems that can be solved. Some basic guidelines for communicating with physicians. Address physicians by name. Hello, Dr. Johnson. I'm calling about your patient, Mrs. Jones. Have the patient information and the chart available. So if you can be at a computer with that chart pulled up, 
have your patients vital, most recent vital signs. And if they're not very recent, get some before you call. <laughs> Unless they're coding, get some vital signs to call that doctor. Have some vital signs, have the information that you need to give them and have it, if you need to write it down so that you'll remember in order what you wanna say, do that. And have that patient chart open. So if they say, oh, what was their CBC yesterday? I can click over and pull that up. Give me just a second and pull that up. So have patient information in the chart available. Clearly verbalize the concern and the reason. And so this is the nurse part. Now, here comes the provider part that we're not always in control of, but we can advocate for. Providers should take nursing concerns seriously. And I know that you've all had experiences where that didn't happen, but providers should be taking concerns seriously. Um, develop an appropriate follow-up plan. So the follow-up plan would be, can I, um, you want to do these, um, you want to do these, follow, you want to give these orders, you want to do these interventions, give us medication. Uh, when do you want me to check back with you? <coughs> and the provider should consider that plan. The provider should say, okay, yeah, let me know if the next um, hemoglobin is lower. Let me know if the potassium doesn't come up after that bolus. Uh, focus on the patient's problem and leave out extraneous information. The provider's part of this is that they need to give adequate orders. <coughs> both should act professionally at all times and both should continue to monitor it and communicate. Now, I know that I put some things in here about how the provider is supposed to behave. We can't always control that. We can advocate for it, but what we can control is how we behave, our own actions. So the last section of this, I'm gonna talk about communication with upper level management and conflict resolution.